living longer, better. How technology and innovation will invent a new future of old age. Joseph Coughlin, MIT Age Lab, Cambridge, USA. Good afternoon. I was born the year the wall went up, and I was in Washington, D.C. when it came down. I also had hair that year as well. I'd like to join me in thinking about the future, and if you're with any luck, it's about all our futures of old age. If you think about the alternative, it's not nearly as pretty. Now, what are the class participation today will be 10% of your grade. What are the two things we say we can depend upon in society? Death and taxes. Well, apparently taxes, yes. Death, not so much. You see, the funeral industry has been uh, lamenting, is the best way to put it, that they are losing sales due to the fact that we are living longer. I'd like you to think about aging and demography in general. As the best way to put it is demography is destiny. Unlike technology that we may forecast, economics, we use a little bit of witchcraft and a little bit of math, and we hope that there's something in the future. But all of you are in the room. But the new demographics is a disruptive demographics. Not only are there more of us, but we have greater expectations to live longer and to live better, and there may be technology to make that possible. I want you to think of this following article. It was in The Lancet a number of years ago. It suggested that half the children born in the so-called rich world, much of Asia, Europe, North America, will live to age 100. Think about that for a moment. But in fact, we'd like to forecast for the future, but we're not in the future. But there's some other studies that have come out recently that suggest that for those of us that are around 50 years old, we'll use that as an average age in the room here, have a 14% chance of making it to age 100. So let's see what your chances are. Did you choose your parents wisely? Are you eating well? And did you exercise and live in a non-stressed environment? I want each of you to look behind your chair right now and to see whether you picked up the 14% lucky card. Is there a 100 garland behind your chair? If you do not have the garland, <laughs> life is a lottery, if you will. So, there you go. For those of you that will live to 100, we'll keep talking. For the rest of you, you may go to coffee now. <laughs> We're living longer, and that's certainly making society much older. But there's something else that's going on. We're not just graying. We're choosing not to have children. You need roughly 2.1 children to keep a population even. Throughout Europe, the population is below replacement level. The United States is barely at replacement level, largely due to immigration. And if you look at certain cities, certain areas, the immigration level is down to like 0 0.4, 0 0.5 per mom to keep that population up. This changes the balance of what the world used to be like. The demographics of tomorrow have never been experienced before across humanity or anywhere in the world. And in fact, you know that it seems that we cannot pay people to have children even if we want to. Singapore, South Korea, other countries, including Germany, have incentives to have children. Once we stop, or once we have teenagers, we decide not to have children. But if you start thinking about what the demographics look like around the world, by 2047, we will have a cross point where there will be more people over age 60 than there will be children, I'm sorry, more than children under age 15. So around the world, this is not just about the developed world. In fact, in the developing economies, what we have to be concerned about is will they get rich before they get old? So let's talk about a few countries. Let's pick, say, Germany. I love coming to Germany, one of the best innovative places in the world. They're getting older. They may be losing population. But let's not make that into a problem. It's an idea for innovation. Let's make an anti-aging beer. But think about what's happening here. This is not just changing how we live in society, but it is also changing the future of work, the future of play, where we live. This is the only picture you'll remember all day. <laughs> Japan is roughly 127 million people. By mid-century, it may go down to about 80 to 85 million. And already today, they are selling more diapers than, for adults than they are for children. And you can run to China, but don't run for too long. The entire population of the United States in 2050 is supposed to be 400 million. The population of the over 60 set in China will be 437 million or thereabouts. In fact, did you ever think that you would live to see the following? There is a workforce shortage in China. And by mid-century, they will be an entire nation in midlife crisis. 
Finally, that's another piece of class participation. All of you born between 1946 and 64, please raise your hand. You are the people our parents warned us about. And what I mean by that is to think about it in the United States, one baby boomer, as we like to all be called, is turning 68 once every seven to eight seconds. It's not about the numbers, ladies and gentlemen. This is a new generation of high expectations. Do you believe any of you will age as politely as your parents did? Very unlikely. You've got greater expectations, new technology, and I doubt you're going to be sitting home waiting for the grandchildren to come visit. This is a new political push as much as a demographic reality. So I say, if you're going to live older, <laughs> you know, you can carry this well-being to a certain extent. But if we're going to live to age 100, let's actually have some fun doing it. But I want you to visualize what this might mean in terms of living to age 100. And the best way to maybe visualize it is maybe in terms of space and time, I'm trying to catch up to my physicist brethren in the audience. You know, does anyone know what life expectancy was, say, in Germany in about 1900? Well, I'll tell you, it was roughly 46. Life expectancy, now, well, let's talk about maybe retirement. Let's talk about retirement for you, 60. For me, the government changed it when I wasn't looking, 67. But you know, it's funny, the fastest growing part of the population is 85 plus. And now we're talking about living to age 100. I want you to start thinking about this is what changes everything. It's about longer life, not old age. What are the things you're going to be doing? How will you live? How will you play? Will my wife want to hear 28 years of the same jokes over and over again? <laughs> so let's, let's visualize, which is a nice way of saying, let's hallucinate a little bit about the convergence of aging and technology coming together to invent how you will all live tomorrow. I have a promise for you. You will be ill, but with any luck of some of our folks here in the audience, you won't be sick. You will be managing one, two, three, four chronic conditions, diabetes, asthma, high blood pressure. But will you be able to manage it so you can walk the dog, visit a grandchild, go to work? That will be the new challenge. And the technologies that are already coming out on the market today, you know, the future they say is here, it's just not widely distributed. It's getting more distributed every day. Implantable sensors, not just about wearables. The spoon that you see on the screen is the bane of my existence. It actually is devised to be able to measure the uh, calorie count in a mix of brownies or some sort of uh, sweet that I like, and then by internet send that to my doctor, my dietitian, or my wife telling me I shouldn't be eating that again. <laughs> How do you get people to do what they're supposed to do, such as something very simple, medication? Does anyone want to take a guess as? How do you motivate people? It's a social psychology question. Well, some would say you pay them. Uh, health loves to use facts and fear. We see how that's worked. Um, and others, well, we had a student that was very bright, very sweet, but she had a dark side. She suggested guilt was the best way to motivate people. So I want you to introduce you to the farm animal, the P-H-A-R-M animal that we developed. And the farm animal has a picture of your grandchild. And if you don't take your meds, it gets sicker, sadder, sicker, sadder, dies. The next generation is your grandchild gets one, you get one. If they're playing soccer, doing their homework, doing what they're supposed to do, and you're doing what you're supposed to do, both pets happy. Either one of you break the social contract, the bunny gets it. How about work? You know, it's one of the things we think about retiring. We have this vision of retiring means pulling back and getting, you know, being more relaxed. Are you really thinking that you can be off the grid for 50 to 60 years, 20 years? of schooling, and then 30 years of retirement. That means, frankly, not much time. In the United States, 40% of people over age 50 say they plan to work until they drop. Even OECD countries worldwide have suggested in their surveys that they want to work for money, meaning, and social purpose. And by the way, it's not just a matter of wanting to stay in the workplace. Despite the great unemployment problems we have in Europe, what we have in North America, we've got pockets of great need of knowledge. We are missing, yes, indeed, clowns, but we're also missing doctors, nurses, engineers, defense contractors. We have a glut of certain areas, and we have an absence of others where the average age in many of those areas, such as engineering, is in the 50s. Doctors, 53. Nurses, 49. So yes, there's unemployment, but there's great gaps. So I say one of the things we need to think about is changing the nature of education. Go back to school, always. Do you really believe that what you learn from 0 to 24 is going to carry you a lifetime, given the speed of knowledge and the speed of technology? Singapore, the United States, England, a few other countries are experimenting with lifetime education to make the business case for you to stay in the workplace. How about re-engineering where we live, where we play, getting around? 
You know, the future of the car we know is about automation. In my lab, we're working on the future of the car being environments, high-performance environments that detect how you feel. Are you stressed? Are you fatigued? What's your pulse rate and the like? But then changing the environment to bring you up into a productive zone or bringing you down if you're too stressed overall. Imagine that in your car, but also imagine it where you work, healthcare, and the like. This is Agnes, the Age Gain Now Empathy System. My students and companies we work with wear this to get the feeling of what it's like to be about 78 or 80 years old with various conditions, so that when they open the package, they realize that the Sicilia can be better. When they open a car door, then get into the car, they realize it needs to be re-engineered. And places like transit systems and where we live and work also need to be re-engineered as well. In fact, little things you don't think about every day that add to the friction of old age, where we shop, reaching for the tall part of the shelf or the lower part of the shelf where the typical products for older adults are placed, re-engineering the CVS drug stores in the United States or the metro stores here in Europe, rethinking where you live. You know, you may not move to the house of the future, but the house of the future is going to come to you because the appliances that you're buying, whether you turn them on or not, are getting smarter. We may all be saying the same, but our appliances will be getting smarter. Imagine a mirror, for instance, that will be able to do a checkup a day looking at capillary changes in your face, saying, Joe, not only are you balder, but your blood pressure seems to be getting up, and that way you can always start to be more predictive and proactive about healthcare, not have these silly technologies that help you once you've fallen up, fallen down. I want to make sure that I know that you're feeling badly before you fall down. So your refrigerator, your fork, and everyone else will be talking to many people and things perhaps about you all in the spirit of well-being. Now, how many of you have been to Japan? How many of you have used a smart toilet in Japan? How many of you have been attacked by a smart toilet in Japan? <laughs> now, I'm talking about, I'm now, I'm going to keep this in computer science vernacular because we're approaching dinner. I want you to imagine a toilet that, shall we say, downloads from the user body temperature, did you take your medication, what are you eating, and then uploads that information via the internet to a call center, to a hospital, to maybe an adult daughter who actually cares that you took your meds and you need to eat. In fact, there's actually a pilot program with these technologies now to facilitate home delivery of the food product that your toilet has decided that you're missing from your diet. <laughs> Caregiving. We can't forget that there's old, there's very old, and extreme old. Imagine this. One in three families in Europe, one in four in the United States are taking care of an older adult. Well, there's a shortage of children. That means that retirement is fundamentally different. We used to retire with the belief that our children will take care of us. How's that working out now that we're not having children? So we're going to have to think about how technology is going to fill in that gap. So robotics, the ability to have a wheelchair, find where you want to be. Take me to the kitchen, take me to the bathroom, take me to see the doctor. It will do that already. Paro, the robotic seal that lives in my lab, gives emotional support by recognizing your face and your voice over time. It is now being used in Europe and Japan the United States for Alzheimer's patients and dementia patients. And then telecare, telemedicine. It's been around for 50 years. It's finally catching on. The ability to not only contact with family, but to have checkups once a day rather than once you're sick. And, you know, if we're doing toilets, we've got to do diapers as well. I want you to imagine a digital Dan skin. My colleague here, David Newman, is developing a spacesuit for the trip to Mars. It takes about 18 months. I want you to imagine over that 18 months, you leave a 30-year-old and you come back a 75-year-old osteoporotic. I want you to imagine clothing that would go underneath, shall we say, your civilian clothes that will keep you from hurting yourself should you fall. Wearable computing to be able to manage and monitor you, motivate how well you are. But also, the idea would be to make it possible so it's under your clothes to keep you well. Now, some companies are actually looking at diapers now to be able, to, shall we say, to tweet that you may need a change. I think we'll wait on that for a little bit. <laughs> but lastly, you know, old age should not just be about old age. It should be about quality of life. So finding fun and romance. So whether it's digital uh, uh, play games, for instance, this is a picture of a senior center outside of London where the woman in between is about 95 years old. She won the game by belting the gentleman next to her. The exercises we've developed online for uh, the PlayStation and for others, not just to have fun, but to stay in shape. And gentlemen in the audience, we have a problem. The highest divorce rate around the world now, in the developed countries at least, is amongst the 50 plus. <clears throat> yes, I hear you. Does anyone want to know why that we are divorced over 50 and who initiates it? She does. Number one reason, 90% of women will tell you, because he bores me. And the leading place now, here, do you need a hand? 
<laughs> it's part of the job. And frankly, the number one place for dating online is no longer for young people. You need water? You good? Okay. Uh, it's not just for old people, but for this gentleman online. Let me conclude with the following. Cathedral building in Europe has always intrigued me. We did not need those buildings because of numbers. It was not just because of faith. It was because we wanted to see how good we could be at math, architecture, and engineering. Ladies and gentlemen, please build a cathedral with me, not just to live longer and better. It's about what science can do and what society can become. Thank you very much.